was composed by his wife, Lauren, and she was unbelievable throughout this whole thing. She was incredible. So we thank her. And Ab and Michelle and I actually stayed all weekends and nights and sort of did this after our regular job. So this is really a labor of love for us. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, I have uh, two quick questions. One is, um, the, the, particularly the shot of Kimu near the beginning of the film, it's a long shot from several hundred yards away. When and where was that taken? And also, uh, did you use the iPod much and what was on it? Well, uh, I can tell you that. Listen to the iPod every day with all Lawrence music. And the shot of Kimu was taken by Todd because in the very beginning they could be within uh, visual distance. But in order to be competing, they could they really couldn't be. So just when they separated, he could see him and he could shoot him. And after that, they weren't allowed to be near each other. But I can't tell you what it's like. It's a, and the long shots that you see of Todd, he placed the camera, tracked, went back for the camera. So every all the footage that you see is shot by him. It was it was unbelievable. But you know what makes us. We sat in an edit room watching Timu for hours and hours and hours. We were like, he's 27 years old. What a baby. <laughs> <laughs> like, What's the matter with Timu? <laughs> you know, we were like, ah, get him off the ice. <laughs> 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 Any? Yes? Yeah. Any other questions? Well, you know, I mean, basically, he, he thought the skis were going to work. And he didn't realize, and once they broke, he thought he'd be able to repair them. And I guess it was one of those things where he did have, he had to cut the liners out of his boots to get grips and stuff like that. But I think he just really believed that the skis would work for him. And it's also not something, you're not supposed to walk. You're not supposed to snowshoe. You're supposed to ski. And the crazy thing is, he was offered a chance that somebody drop ship him, you know, drop off at, there were certain points at which he could uh, be aided by people, and they could have dropped off skis, and he said, no, because then I wouldn't be, it wouldn't be unaided. I need to do this completely organically. And you have to wonder why did everything stay so heavy also, according to the rules, he could never drop anything. Oh. Everything he had had to stay on yeah, he that couldn't leave a footprint. Couldn't leave a footprint, couldn't leave litter, couldn't leave anything, couldn't bury something in the snow, no chance. Had to carry everything that he didn't consume. I mean, and that's, I mean, after going through hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of footage, um, you, know, we, you know, we sat and we said, we started out this project saying, we're going to document your trek 700 miles to, and, you know, to the South Pole. But what it ended up being was just a movie about somebody's spirit to continue going after. I mean, we would talk to him on the phone at times and we're like, he got to be crazy and he just never gave up. He didn't so, even make sense when we spoke to him. Yeah, I mean, so when we started to chop it down, we started to see this man is just the pure endurance and his mental will to continue on. It was just, it was, it was, it was just unbelievable. It was yeah. an, it's inspiring. It was inspiring for us to be a part of it. Randy? Yeah. Yes. Well, he's actually in Africa right now on a personal issue, but he, we are going to be going with him either to Borneo and Sumatra um, or to Haiti. Uh, for another huge expedition with a, a singular focus, and it's, it's, just, it's unbelievable. And every time he tells us what he's going to do, like he says, I'm going to zip line 150 miles on the zip line that's only set up by drug dealers. We're like, let's take that for the last episode. Because <laughs> then we'll do the memorial episode, and it's great. But yeah, I have the Jewish mother reaction, which is, please, put on a helmet. <laughs> so, yeah. Speaking of which, redheaded boy, do you have a question? <laughs> Can I use the yeah, mic? What? You want, I'll talk to you the way I talk to you at home. What do you want? How many hours of footage was it? Seventy. Really? Seventy hours of footage. And the thing is, it was in film, obviously, because of the temperature. It is on a digital disc. However, because of the way it was shot, we shoot everything. Everything's coded by minute, by second. 
What we got was 70 hours with no markings on it. So there was no way to find anything. So we sit in and say, okay, if where he talks about being tired, you know, he's in the tent. <laughs> Unbelievable. So it was made it very difficult, but again, very exciting. Anybody? Yes? So how much of it, like, we didn't actually see in the movie that much of it actually, like, walking. So yes. How much of that was actually filmed? Everything that we had, we used. I mean, it was hard for him to shoot himself walking. That camera, I believe, became part of his reason for surviving. It became like Wilson in Castaway. He talked to that camera like it was his best friend. He would wipe it off. It was a really interesting sort of dynamic, he, like him in the pit. He also said on vis um, bad visibility, if he placed the camera, walked away from it, he'd never find it again. And the thought of losing that camera just devastated him. So he was very, very particular when he would put the camera down and walk away from it because if he, he never found it again, he would lose that part of him. So that was one of the And things. we sent six cameras with him and only one came back. <laughs> yeah. I'm also curious like, if you guys are airing any other footage anywhere or is that anything? Well, he has some on his website, but that, no, believe me, there's plenty more. So, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, can you just talk about what it was like uh, when you guys first like got your hands on all the footage and were like able to start digging through it, just a little bit of the editing pro process, and also how you guys um, became like attached to the project or like met him or whatever? Well, we met when he came in to talk to us, and honestly, I've got a big personality. He took up all the air in the room. He was unbelievable, and the passion he took, with which he described what he was going to do, totally convinced me that he was a documentary. And we had a, a very hard time convincing television networks because they would say things like, ah, no, wait, but it's dwarfs in it? And believe me, we produce enough TV shows. Everywhere you go, they ask you if you can put dwarfs on your show. Everywhere, it's a consistent or case. So that's why we decided to do it ourselves, and then I um, co-opted Michelle to work with me because she's truly a filmmaker. And so, I'm sorry, um, and like, just, can you just describe what it was like when you first got to like check the footage out? We just watched it all. Yeah, we and watched that's all we did, beginning to end, and took notes and just yeah. over and over and over again. What we did was create, off of the 70 hours, we then created a 16-hour sequence, and then a nine-hour sequence, watch, and continued to watch it down again until finally we started to get a manageable length. But every time, like when it was a 16 hour, we'd watch that whole 16 hours again and then go back and recut and recut. So and we got a huge fight. When, when you see the front, like you're watching the, yeah, when you're watching the film, you're saying, wow, it's like, I don't know how many minutes we're into it, and he's only on day four. It's oh. like, or day seven, you're thinking to yourself, whew, oh my God, how long is this film? But, um, <laughs> but it's like, but the thing was, so much happened on those first couple days that really yeah, established who he was going to be throughout the rest of the track. So it was really quite difficult to cut it down any more than what we had done. Is that Eric? Yeah. yeah. Did he ever call you? Yes. He did call us during the expedition, yeah. And <laughs> he wasted his butt <laughs> on the shell, and I mean, he was more. He, yeah, he, yes, he did. Yes. Well, he, uh, he, 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 when he landed the South Pole, it was Christmas Eve, and he literally said he called, and he, and I saw this. And, and we had been uh, wait in panic because in panic. he had not heard from him, and we thought, you know, he's dead. We were filmmakers, but we also were friends, and we were people who cared about this man. And when we lost track, and his wife lost track, we really thought he was dead. And so we get this, I get this number on the phone, and he leaves this message and says, it's me, I'm at the South Pole. I know the number's really crazy, but I'm going to call back in about five minutes, pick up. And so, and the first thing he said is, we did it. I'm like, dude, you did it. I'm like, well, I'm back now. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, so, uh, he's just, you know, it was incredible. Yeah. Incredible. And I got the same message. It was really fun. Yeah. How long did it take after we got to the South Pole to get picked up and come home? A long time, actually. It's very hard. You can't get in and you can't get out. There's a very small window and there's very bad weather. And in fact, there was a, or even places he was trekking across, there would have been no way to go get him. So it took about a week 
just to get him to base camp. Base camp. And by the way, here's the funniest thing. There's a gift shop at the South Pole. <laughs> <laughs> There's a gift shop. And normally the scientists who took him in, they're not allowed to take in explorers. They're not allowed to feed them. They're not allowed to give them alcohol. They're not allowed to have, because they don't want to encourage this. And, you know, they don't want to encourage people out there because people die every year. They die. This is unbelievable that not only did he break the world record, become the first American, but he lived. Yeah. Why didn't he wear sunglasses and does he have vision problems? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I can't believe I didn't tell him to wear sunglasses. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, we're masked a lot of the time. But does he have vision problems? I don't know. Believe. Okay, here's something you won't believe. He smokes. <laughs> but he just gave it up. I know. Unbelievable. Yes. He's okay. Mm -hmm. Totally okay. All right. One last. Yeah. yeah. You said that there were like spots where you, there's no way you could have picked him up. There's no yeah. way you could have picked up. Yeah. So basically, if something had happened and you lost, he would have died. Mm -hmm. He knew it. He would have died. But as you said, he didn't want to be his father. He was never giving up on anything. He's an amazing person, and his yeah. wife is an amazing person. Uh, absolutely, and we thank you for the amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing.